Ladies and gentlemen, joining me tonight is Kevin Hayden, a former police officer with the New Orleans Police Department. He ended up testifying against fellow officers with that department for the FBI after Hurricane Katrina. He's been interviewed for RT several times, including with his one-time crush, Lucy Kavanaugh. But tonight we're talking to him to see why he quit the force and why he is now such a passionate liberty activist and Ron Paul supporter. He runs the website truthistreason.net and is active with his local meetup group for Ron Paul in Oklahoma. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good to be here. So let's start with your personal background. How did you end up on the police force in New Orleans in the first place? Well, I was, um, I was waiting to turn 21, really, um, for several years prior to that. Really wanted to be a cop, didn't know if I wanted to be, you know, federal agent, DEA, but knew I wanted to do something. And um, out of the blue... Well, hold, um, hold on, what, what was behind that? Because this, this interview is not about just the mechanics of your story, but the mechanics of, of your transformation. So tell us, why did you want to be a police officer? What was the appeal of that? What service were you looking to provide for people? Uh, when I was 18, um, I actually had a girlfriend that ended up um, dying in a one-car um, one car accident. And uh, it was due to drinking and driving. And that really started me on my path to become a police officer, um, wanting to kind of to be that, that voice of change um, and to help people. And as cliche as it sounds, I really wanted to kind of change a community. And I thought being a police officer would be uh, one of the quickest ways to do that. And did the experience live up to your expectation? Uh, it did at the beginning. Um, I kind of I, I sunk into the culture of law enforcement. Uh, my first several years, um, I, I worked on a, a proactive street crimes unit. We targeted guns, drugs, stuff like that, and I had a blast. I thought I was doing the best thing for the city, you know, enforcing most of the drug laws, um, warrants, kicking in doors, and and I just lived and breathed uh, doing that. And then one day, I just kind of woke up. Well, hold on, hold on. There's there's another aspect of your of your work with the police force that that I want to point out for the sake of our listeners, because the liberty movement, the broader freedom movement in the United States, full of people that understand that law enforcement officers are the mechanism of oppression of a citizen uh, of a citizenry by the government, but also they're providing a legitimate service and they're for legitimate reasons, and that a lot of people in the police force are providing services that would be provided even if we didn't have a government monopoly on the use of force, services for the public safety, for property rights, preservation that would exist in a free market. I just want to point that out because you were also a detective in the Robbery and Property Crimes Division. Can you, can you see that there was a, a sort of difference between that and the work that you did on, on the Narcotics Task Force? Well, that, I, had, I had such um, genuine goals when I first started. Um, graduated top of my class, um, really excelled in legal and and interpreting the law, and that kind of carried me into it. and And I started out with the best intentions, and then once I got into the culture, um, I just kind of fell into the worst aspects of it. Uh, in New Orleans, it's full of corruption. Um, I, I would say probably seventy percent of the department should probably be fired or indicted, um, and and so it became a a culture, a lifestyle, um, making easy arrest, making um, bad arrest. You know, I, I don't know how many of those I witnessed down there. Was there like a pressure to rack up statistics? That was a big thing. Uh, every, well, I'd say just about every department has an unspoken quota, um, especially when it comes to arrest. With our task force, we had a five arrest minimum goal for every night. Um, wow, and many times five arrest minimum goal for an individual officer Correct. In the narcotics unit every night. Correct. We had a two-man so team. So what happens to an officer that's out on the street who's going, crap, I've only got two arrests for tonight, and I, it's, it's, it's midnight, I'm off my shift in a few hours. What happens in, in those kinds of situations? That, that's that path that, that starts taking officers down the, the easy road. Um, instead of actually trying to make a, a, a difference, you know, maybe arresting um, a, a potential burglar, you know, and using drug laws to get him arrested, uh, they would target college kids, namely. It was easy or, or tourists. Um, you and know, and minorities, nickel. of course, as is always the case in the drug war. Right, right. Well, in New Orleans, you have a population of the 70% or more black. Um, 
and the colleges that were down there, quite a few colleges, predominantly rich white kids from the Northeast, um, you know, just moved to the big city. And so they would just start nickel and diamond everybody to, to rack up 10 or 15 arrests a night. Wow. And, uh, and, and many times, if, if you made your quota, you could just go ahead and leave, leave shift early. Or oh. if you got a gun. Uh, you could, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so you're saying, so a cop on a shift, like an eight-hour shift, expected to make a quota of arrests, if they make those arrests before their shift is up, they get off work early. Happen, yeah, happened a lot. And I mean, unless something big was going on that they just needed. needed right, uh, right, obviously. You know, but I mean, bodies, talk about uh, a warped incentive system. I mean, this, yeah. is, this, is, this is what happens when you take the free market out of the accountability, because in a free market, communities still want police to provide for the public safety. They still mm -hmm. want private security to protect property rights. But when you take that and you give the government a monopoly on that in law mm. enforcement, you get this kind of perverse incentive system for the officers that we supposedly trust with the public safety on the streets. I mean, this is right. nuts. Right. That, that, that was across the board. Um, on, if you arrested somebody with a, with a gun and dope, um, you'd get a whole day off. We called it a gun day. Whoa. And it was no a day off. Now, I just, I just want to point something else out here just to make it clear because you said that people weren't making or officers weren't making arrests of potential armed robbers or violent criminals or people that were committing real crimes because drug crime arrests were easier. So what you're telling me is that we, the public, or the, rather the public in New Orleans, trusted the police department to provide for the public safety, to protect property rights, so on and so forth, and yet because of this incentive system, the resources that our tax dollars or their tax dollars go to fund this department are then, the, the resources generated for them are then diverted away from legitimate services that a police department would provide in, in, in providing for the public safety and protecting property rights and diverted into violating individual rights, violating privacy rights, and carrying out the continued racism of the war on drugs. Is that a fair description of what was going on? Uh, uh, that's pretty fair, except your, your first part when you said the public trusted the police department. <laughs> okay, they, fair uh, enough. They, well, maybe not know, in New Orleans. <laughs> long time corruption. Everybody knows, um, you know, cops down there are just dirty. There's more police officers from New Orleans on death row than any department in the world. Um, they've been arrested for murder, for heroin trafficking, cocaine trafficking, armed robberies, murder of other police officers. It's a, it's a very dirty, corrupt department in general. So the, and the public knows this, you know, and they, they thrive on that. And they, they hated the police officers um, because the department never gave them a reason to trust them um, through brutality and corruption, um, you know, outright theft. Failure to provide the, the supposed yeah, legitimate services. The, the basic serve and protect. There, there was no serving and there was, there was little protecting going on. Obviously, when, when we would have a rash of, of robberies or something, you know, cases, there was a, a good attempt to solve them, but then even, you know, you start getting into 60 days or so on an open case, and, and hey, I could get a, I could get a whole day off for arresting a guy with drugs and a gun. Well, you, you start getting pressure on, on cases for detectives, and then they just start picking anybody who's got that MO or gets arrested for another armed robbery. If he fit the description of a young black male in a white T-shirt, well, you know, go ahead and pin <laughs> seven other robberies on him and um, let the courts deal with it. And then the courts down there are such a joke. So you, you have murderers that literally spend four years in prison in a Lego. Now, I just want to point out that oftentimes some of us more philosophically extreme libertarians, some of us who take the non-aggression principle seriously and, and look at what is a police department, and when you, when you really boil it down, you have to say, well, this is an armed gang that is imposing its will on, on the people in a given area. And it's not true of all police departments. Obviously, NOPD being far and above for corruption and all these other problems. But when we characterize police departments as armed gangs of thugs, even though there are, there are many among them who want to provide the legitimate services, as you yourself started out as when you joined the force, it really makes it seem like a very obvious, almost mild observation now to say the New Orleans Police Department is simply a gang of violent thugs 
imposing their will and exercising a form of tyranny over the city of New Orleans. Is that accurate? Uh, absolutely. It, it, there are some departments with New Orleans, probably at the top, along with Chicago and a few others, right. that they are the largest street gang in that area. Um, you know, there, there's no other way to describe it. And, and in many cases, they're actually committing more crimes than, than the civilian population in, in, in its entirety, yeah, even, especially in, in with drugs areas, yeah. and, and, and a lot of law enforcement officers that take advantage of their position to enrich themselves through various means of, of, of corruption, committing drug distribution crimes themselves. I mean, I, I, I had the honor, I suppose, recently of, of smoking marijuana on <laughs> Christmas Day with a, a, a police officer who happens to be an active police officer. Of course, he was <laughs> off duty at the time. Right. Um, and I'm not going to put his name out there. But <laughs> yeah, I, I, started, I, I, I shared this with my friends on Facebook. And next thing you know, people are saying, what's the big deal? Like, my, when, right. when I was living in Chicago, my drug dealer, my, the guy I bought <laughs> weed from, was a cop. And he pulled up in his right. patrol car. And like, that would be it. And yeah. it's the perfect well, cover. Who, who's going to pull him over? You exactly. Know? That, that's kind of the mentality there. Okay, so I, I want to move on with your, your personal story and, and give you a chance to share uh, the, the really important transformation that you experienced. But let's start with, with what happened with you in, uh, in New Orleans uh, following Hurricane Katrina. Katrina itself uh, was really like a bad zombie movie uh, gone wrong. Uh, one, of, one of the big things that, um, that I'll, I'll never forget, we had like California Highway Patrol along with NYPD and Dallas police patrolling the streets. Um, you know, military Humvees everywhere with infrared scopes. I mean, everything, the whole shebang. And our jail had been flooded. The, uh, the central lockup had flooded out and they'd moved most of the prisoners. A few of them died in their cells with the water. But um, our, our new jail was the Amtrak train station. They set up several kennels. It's, I don't have a better word for it, but they set up these like 10 foot by 10 foot kennels and that was jail sales. It was right on the uh, the platform there for the trains. And you had the NYPD's correctional department uh, really running the thing with some help from Border Patrol, California Highway Patrol, several, I mean, just a handful of different agencies. Uh, immigration and Customs were there. And, and to me, it was kind of my first awakening of starting to ask, you know, what is going on here? Why do we have all these things? Why can't our department or the Sheriff's Department handle this? And um, as things progressed, you know, over the next probably two years until 2007 uh, is when I first heard Ron Paul speak and first heard about him and really started looking into what led me down the rabbit hole. So, so you, had this, you had this dilemma in front of you. You had all of these problems that you saw in the police force. You saw the problems after Hurricane Katrina and all the different agencies coming in. And it was like, uh, if, if I may, sort of a, just a, a problem or a, a, a giant Rubik's Cube or a big lock in front of you. And, and then the message of Ron Paul, the message of liberty came in to, in, into your mind, into your heart. And it, it was like a key, was it not, that sort of unlocked it, the door and, and it explained all of these things? It, it really was. That's a good way to describe it. It was like the world, the, the weight of the world had been lifted off my shoulders when I really started looking at things what they really were you know and i started looking at the aspects of federal funding and why the police department is doing what it's doing and and their motives and i really tried to address some of those issues and started asking questions and of course you know like the military if you ask why you get on everybody's bad side they just you know shut up and follow orders and that and that's how the department was and then i started asking my partners you know why are we doing this or doing that and it ultimately ended up into a fist fight one night um, I, I was trying to talk, uh, talk to him about drug laws, the war on drugs, all sorts of topics. And, uh, so gotten, just you have, having a friendly conversation with a fellow officer challenging the paradigm of the drug war and law enforcement, and correct. it goes to fists. It, a fist fight with me on the scene. Um, there was another one that uh, I had, I had two, two people I was questioning. We had them in custody. And um, I took one into the interrogation room, was talking to him. And when I came back out, the second one, of course, all my partners were standing out there, was bleeding. And so when I tried to figure out who had hit him or why he was bleeding, that turned into another fight where we had captains and lieutenants breaking up the fight uh, because I was protecting the suspect. Um, I mean, honestly, it wasn't a good guy, but he still has rights. And that, that was one of the big moments that really pushed me over the edge to to question things and so I, i'm not on the right side here 
So what was the conclusion that you came to that ultimately led you to quit the force? Uh, you know, I, <laughs> after fall, I, I, I helped out with the Ron Paul campaign in 07 and 08. I was still a police officer. And after about a year, year and a half of that, um, January 14th of 2009, I'd had two or three days off. I don't recall. And um, over that weekend, I just did a lot of thinking. And Monday, I walked in into my station and just handed my captain my resignation. I said, you know, this, I'm not going to be a part of this machine. I'm not going to be another cog in, in the ever-growing police state. You know, I am that jackbooted thug that you see on TV. And, and I certainly didn't want to be friends with them. I didn't want any part of it. And I didn't want to be associated with it any, any longer. Now, just to play devil's ad advocate here, and, and again, to, to recognize the desire of, of many well-intentioned officers to provide legitimate services to their communities. Is it possible that, that in America today there are places where you can work as a law enforcement agent and kind of have confidence that you're doing good work, that you're really only providing those legitimate services, that you're really just serving your community and not the machine? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a lot of mostly medium-sized towns um, that are out there. And even, I mean, I'm here in Oklahoma City. For the most part, I, I would certainly give this department um, an A grade. They have very few officers that get in trouble. That, that's a very, relative A grade still, right? Compared it, it to is. the other they, departments. They have few cases of brutality and, and use of force violations. Whereas, you know, obviously in New Orleans, there are dozens of, dozens of them every day. Um, but there, there are departments where you find officers that are in it for the right reasons and they're, they're following their heart and trying to provide a service to protect people and and come to their aid when they call you know in domestics or a robbery you're there to comfort them you're there to be a counselor and there, there's so many roles as a police officer and i think it is possible but it's growing harder every day for most officers especially though those those new officers you see on the street most of them just came back from iraq afghanistan they've got that mentality as you as i'm sure you can understand um and they put on the police uniform and you can't take Afghanistan tactics and apply them to your neighborhood. It doesn't work. At least so, not in America. Well, unfortunately, it's, it's um, not working on an increasingly larger and more significant scale every day here in the United States. And, you know, as, as you yourself said, um, you, you thought that uh, what, what we have here in the United States is our, our country, to use your words, headed towards a national version of Katrina. What do you mean by that? It's it, zero accountability. Um, cops were stealing just, you know, just as much as, as the thieves and looters. Um, a lack of care, a lack of, um, yeah, the shootings are a perfect example. There were so many police involved shootings there. The Danziger 7 being one of the big ones um, on the Danziger Bridge. Right. I believe four or five individuals were shot. Uh, we were all in support of the officers at the time. Uh, they had been indicted. Of course, you know, rallying the troops together. We were out there cheering them on when they turned themselves in. And uh, several months later, when we started hearing pieces of the real story about how these people were executed um, and unarmed when they were shot with AK-47s, it, it really started painting a picture. And that was just, that was a crack in the door. And when the FBI came in, um, I think they've had 20 or 30 different cases or individuals indicted, mostly for murder or shooting-related cases. Uh, they burned bodies, um, shot people. One of the cases I testified on, um, I had left the department already, and the FBI contacted me, and I was um, gave a, a grand jury testimony against two police officers involved in a shooting at Danny Brumfield at the convention center. It was, I heard one story that night and it sounded reasonable. And it turns out it, after, after the FBI contacted me, I read the police report that they filed in the coroner's report. And it turns out he was shot in the back and had no weapon. And that's not the story that was given to us that night. Um, so there, there's a lot of things that a, a national version of that, you know, where your police chief says, we're going to take back the city and, you know, you do what you got to do, meaning, you know, if you have to shoot somebody, just do it. And during Katrina, all it required was a, a short gist, as they call it. There, there was no homicide investigation. If a police officer shot somebody, it required their immediate supervisor to simply fill out a, a short summary of the incident and file it. So what would you say to your uh, former fellow colleagues on the police department today 
with with your your new perspective and if you had a message to send to all of the other law enforcement officers out there in America, what would it be? I think the biggest thing is that you really need to start questioning things. Things are not as they seem. It's not so black and white. Um, a lot of officers are ingrained with that us versus them mentality. And uh, after being put on the other side of them now, um, I, I really think they, they just need to question things and open their mind and realize when they first signed up, um, you know, did, did they have the best intentions to begin with, and and are they really fit to be a police officer? Okay, well, let me let me ask that question maybe a little more pointedly okay. here for for those who are already questioning, and I think it's hard not to. If you're a police officer in the United States in this day and age, in the era of the internet, of viral videos of police beatings, of the obviousness of the statistics of police brutality, of the obvious futility of the drug war, it seems that it would be harder to not be questioning what is going on in the current paradigm of law enforcement. So for those who are already questioning, Kevin, who are grappling with the issues that you grappled with that led you to the conclusion of walking out of the New Orleans Police Department specifically, and, and obviously you're not saying that every police officer in the United States has some <laughs> right. moral obligation to quit their job tomorrow, but for those that are already grappling with those issues, what would you tell them? I would really encourage them to to not only continue, you know, asking why and and really looking at themselves and and the system as a whole, but I would encourage them to to really stick to their oath, their their sworn oath. And when seeing these things, you know, that in the in the blue culture and the in the brotherhood of police officers, there's that unspoken rule. You know, if you do see something, especially if it's minor, you kind of look past it. But they really need to take an active stand when they do see these violations, when they see violations of the Fourth Amendment, which occur probably in every single department, every day, um, all of these, these massive things add up, and I really think officers need to take a stand. Um, that's probably my best advice. So if an officer is in the position in their department where they feel that they cannot honor their oath to the Constitution and keep their job in that particular department, is that the point at which they have a moral obligation to quit their job? Ad absolutely. Uh, they're certainly not going to be um, an asset to the community. They're not going to be helping anybody. Um, I, I think they really should just drop out. I, I tried to remain into this in the system thinking I could maybe change it from within and kind of steer the machine. But the, the police state is far too powerful. It's far, <clears throat> far too large really to for for one person or even a few people in one department to ever steer you're, you're never going to change it and finally i have one more important aspect of kevin hayden's transformation another epiphany regarding his one-time crush lucy kavanoff <laughs> and that having come to the message of liberty and truly embraced it you've also realized that being an unapologetic statist is is, is quite a turnoff am i right it is all right well thank you very much for joining me ladies and gentlemen Kevin Hayden, truthistreason.net.